Hello all. Hello and welcome to those who have joined us via the CEDA live stream for the ACCC's Enforcement and Compliance Policy Update for 2021. My name is Ali Condon and I'm the Associate Director for Membership at CEDA. CEDA acknowledges that today and every day we are on Aboriginal land. Committed to recognition and reconciliation, we respect elders and support their stated aspirations. As we hear the priorities set out today, we're reminded that the Competition and Consumers Act enduring objective is enhancing the welfare of Australians. This has been the principal long guiding competition policy and I reflect that we require a similar focus on enhancing the welfare of Indigenous Australians through recognition and reconciliation. Today, for the 10th year, we welcome ACCC Chair Rod Sims, who will outline the enforcement and compliance priorities for the Commission for the year ahead. These conversations would not be possible without the incredible support that we receive from our members. So I would like to thank today's sponsors, Gilbert and Tobin, for supporting and contributing to today's discussion. Competition policy remains an important lever that can increase Australia's productivity and living standards, lift business and consumer confidence, drive job creation and workforce participation. In the wake of COVID-19, CEDA will engage in these conversations nationally, focusing on business dynamism and competitiveness and the economic recovery and reinvention. These themes sit amongst others, identified as critical to our members and aligned to our purpose. CEDA's members are essential in delivering on our purpose of pursuing solutions that matter for the greater good. And I would like to acknowledge the contribution of all CEDA members joining us today. As always, your input is vital to these discussions. So please get involved by joining the conversation on Twitter, by using the hashtag ACCC and tagging CEDA News. You can also interact via our Q&A portal. You can access that via the Pigeonhole app or via Pigeonhole cedo.pigeonhole.at using the password ACCC. Here, you can submit questions or vote on others that you would like to see addressed. You can also participate in the CEDA poll, asking, what do you think is the highest priority for improving competition and consumer welfare across the next 12 months in Australia as we emerge from a COVID-19 induced recession? We've got about 20 minutes for the discussion, which commences at 1.30, so please start submitting your questions. Finally, I am so pleased to introduce our facilitator to the stage, Elizabeth Avery. Elizabeth will introduce today's speaker, ACCC Chair Rod Sims, and facilitate an interactive Q&A following Rod's address. Elizabeth is a senior partner and the head of Gilbert and Tobin's competition and regulation group. She advises on a broad range of cutting edge competition law issues, including mergers, enforcement litigation, and investigations, and ongoing strategic and operational advisory work. She has a particular focus on multi-jurisdictional matters, and prior to joining Gilbert and Tobin, was an antitrust lawyer in New York. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your support and for lending your expertise to the discussion. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and Gilbert and Tobin is delighted uh, to be once again um, supporting this event and supporting CEDA um, with all its work, and in particular this great event that it holds each year. Um, before I proceed further, I'd like to also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. And I'm extremely pleased to introduce ACCC Chairman Rod Sims to deliver his first public address for 2021 and reveal the ACCC's priorities for the coming year. Um, it's amazing to think that he's been up here at the beginning of every year for 10 years. Um, but it's always an event we look forward to. And it's also hard to believe that this time last year, 
we were gathered here with very little idea of what was around the corner for us and how the pandemic that's struck the world would affect all of our priorities. It's great that we're all able to be here again physically and also virtually. Um, and now with some light at the end of the tunnel and the first vaccines in Australia being rolled out this week, I feel the optimism in the room. Last year was a, a shocker for most of us. Um, Australia has done better than most, owing to some luck and geography, but also a very strong and coordinated response that has involved many arms of government in Australia, working collaboratively with businesses and the public. And the ACCC played a very big part in that response, and we've welcomed the flexibility and cooperation that the ACCC has brought to bear particularly in its readiness to engage on urgent interim authorisations that have allowed necessary industry collaborations as the business community and the public sought to respond to the health and economic crises, including ranging from banking, supermarkets, airlines and the healthcare sector. By our count, the ACCC received 33 applications for urgent interim authorisation, including 24 in less than a month, more than it would often get in a year the um, workload that that must have imposed is mind-boggling. We look forward to continuing the spirit of cooperation with the ACCC as the pandemic continues to ease. Turning to digital, everyone's favourite topic at the moment, COVID-19 and the pandemic effects have, of course, accelerated existing trends towards digitalisation. Technology has become even more central to our lives, with many observing that innovation that would otherwise have taken many years to implement it had to be rolled out within weeks. It's hard to Im imagine dealing with a pandemic without the services that we now take for granted, cat filters aside. It's also not surprising that governments are sharpening their existing focus on digital platforms and services, and we expect that to be a big feature of 2021, as the work that began with the digital platforms inquiry in 2017 continues with the Advertising Services Inquiry and the five-year Digital Platform Services Inquiry, in which the ACCC is about to release its second interim report focusing on app stores, issues that are also the subject of investigations and enforcement activities all around the world. To date, the ACCC's inquiries have resulted in a number of recommendations, investigations and in, indeed prosecutions, but focusing on breaches of the Australian consumer law in relation to the use of data. But so far, at least, these investigations have not resulted in any competition law proceedings under the newly expanded misuse of market power prohibition or otherwise. This perhaps reflects the significant complexities involved in evaluating conduct by digital platforms where two-sided markets raise fundamental questions about what constitutes a competitive effect where consumers don't pay in currency anyway for the product that they're using. A number of proposals for law reforms have also arisen from the ACCC's um, digital marketing studies, not least of which is the News Bargaining Code, currently attracting global attention, as governments grapple with balancing a range of values including democracy, fairness, the value of an independent press and fostering corporate innovation and free enterprise. No easy balance. Other possible rec changes that have been floated in the course of the market studies include the suggested prohibition of unfair trading practices, where there's a perceived gap in the law due to changes in reducing moral and ethical concepts to legislation. No doubt the need for this prohibition will be hotly debated, as will its scope. We also understand that the ACCC has been considering the merger approval framework and whether any amendments are necessary, including the particular challenges that may arise in relation to digital platforms and how to deal with nascent competitors. Turning to the global landscape, as we enter 2021, we witnessed the ACCC taking on a more prominent role globally, reflecting the more interconnected nature of the global economy and the well-developed collaboration between the ACCC and other competition regulators. In that context, we are seeing an ACCC that is more confident in asserting its own views on the world stage, sometimes aligning with global regulators, but also departing where local market conditions differ or just because it has a different point of view. 
Now I'm delighted to hand over to Rod for what I'm sure will be an illuminating reflection on the year that's passed and what we might expect from the ACCC in 2021. Thank you, Rod. Thanks very much, uh, Elizabeth, and thanks to GNT for sponsoring this, and thanks to CEDA for 10 years. That's just uh, terrific and really much appreciated. Uh, and I agree, it's great to have a, a live event. I have to slightly take one point up with Elizabeth. My own view is it's not much due to luck or geography. I think it's due to governments working very well and particularly closing the borders very early and making sure you had compulsory quarantine. My own view is if that had been tried in other countries, they may have had a similar situation. But anyway, well outside the ACCC's bailiwick, but I think governments, <laughs> governments collectively deserve a lot of credit rather than luck or geography. Um, and look, I um, have to uh, say, and I, it's probably misleading conduct by silence, I should have said it earlier, that I'm actually not going to talk about digital platforms much at all today. Uh, so I'm sure people can get their money back from CEDA, I'm sure they'll, <laughs> although you've eaten the lunch so that's probably not possible. But anyway, I'm sorry, I just thought this was the time to talk about everything else we're doing and so that's what I'm going to do with great enthusiasm. So economics is concerned, I mean we are an economic regulator and economics is concerned with how you grow the pie and how you share the pie. That's basically what economics does. Sometimes I don't like the fact that enough economists don't focus on sharing the pie and just focus on growing it, but that's, that's fine. But the ACCC's role in those two things is important. Obviously competition helps innovation, it helps investment, and when you're dealing with market power and economic rents, uh, that also affects inequality. So what we do matters. I'm not suggesting it's the most important thing in those two debates at all, but it does matter and we are essentially an economic regulator. And I think the points matter particularly in this COVID world. Um, I did say last year that you have to be flexible with your priorities as things could change. Uh, I think I say that every year rather than making any guess about what actually did happen. So we had to refocus our priorities a lot in 2020. Um, we were delivered on many of them and actually I was quite stunned at how, and I'm sure, I'm sure everyone else felt this, this has nothing to do with just us, just how effectively we could all keep working uh, and how productive we could be working from home and that was just a revelation which uh, I'm sure is going to damage CBD property prices for some time to come. Uh, what I want to focus on today is just some of what's going on that, that's occupying us and how we spend our time, how I spend my time. Um, then I'll list our priorities for 2021 and then I'll talk just very briefly about market studies and advocacy, the issues we will be out advocating on in 2021. So what's on before us? Well, we had a, uh, a stunningly busy year. It was, frankly, exhausting with constantly being on um, Microsoft Teams or whatever, the virtual Zoom, a um, uh, whole range of other things. Um, of course, you can never complain about being busy when you've actually still got a job. And in this day and age, it's those who lost their job or lost their business that you have to feel very sorry for. But it was a very busy year. Uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, we had that frantic effort to uh, grant exemptions for businesses to coordinate their activity in ways we normally wouldn't allow, and even in circumstances we normally wouldn't allow, except we had a pandemic. We had a crisis. Uh, Australian businesses, in my view, really wanted to cooperate to make sure we got out of that crisis. I sat in on all the supermarket meetings. Uh, we were embedded in meetings where telecommunications providers, energy companies, medical companies were getting together to make sure Australia got through the pandemic and we're, we're proud of the role we played in that. Uh, I did enjoy international criticism though uh, because the, the 
competition regulators were saying, now's the time we've got to protect competition and what the bloody hell is the ACCC doing authorising all this anti-competitive conduct? I think they quite lost um, ends and means there somehow. Uh, anyway, we did that and we're very pleased with it. We also had our COVID task force that had to deal with a whole lot of travel issues, um, a whole range of other consumer issues as well, but the travel issues is what completely dominated our time. We had a 500% increase in complaints about the travel sector. Um, we had to adjust our priorities. So just as we had to pull together a team to do the exemptions, we had to pull together a team to uh, do all this COVID consumer work. Um, and, you know, I keep saying to a lot of people, we're not a complaints handling body. And I think the vast bulk of, I mean, you know, 90% of the population thinks we, think we are a complaint handling body. Uh, when in fact we're an enforcement organisation. But when COVID came along, we actually had to change our approach. And we were frankly dealing with complaints. We dealt with over 100 companies and we got them to, um, I mean, some of them would have done it anyway, don't get me wrong. I don't quite know, cause, you know exactly what effect we had, but we had to get them to comply with, uh, we couldn't use consumer guarantees as those who play in this field know, but we made sure companies complied with their terms and conditions. Uh, that was very tricky legal stuff. Uh, I learnt about frustration of contract, which all the lawyers would know about, but it was a new lesson for me, still learning. Uh, and I think the numbers who think we're now a complaint handling authority is probably 99.9, .9, so we're stuck with that. But it actually did get a lot of people a lot of refunds. Um, we did have to threaten a bit of enforcement action in a couple of cases to get where we needed to get, but we were pleased with what we were able to do there. And we took enforcement action against people uh, who were talking about protecting consumers from the virus, the Lorna Jane case, um, where we uh, took action in relation to misleading claims about antivirus activewear. Uh, so there was just a whole lot of stuff COVID stuff that uh, occupied us that uh, we had not anticipated and that was work uh, that was just not on our radar. But we also kept on doing, I mean, we largely kept on doing what we were doing anyway. We had a bit of a slowdown with the court system, as uh, others here will know better than I do, but, you know, we, we, we kept on with most of our criminal prosecutions. Uh, we've just now finished the third and final roll-on, roll-off shipping cartel conviction between the three cases. Uh, there's a penalty of 83.5 million. That's been a successful outcome from our point of view. Uh, this week, we've got a committal proceeding taking place uh, in the CFMM. I've got to always make sure I put in the second M these days, EU prosecution in Canberra. And next week, we've got the country care matter, the first contested uh, criminal trial, and that starts in the federal court in Melbourne. Later this year, we've got a uh, money transfer case, and of course, uh, we've got the pre-trial hearings in the ANZ Deutsche and Citibank case. We've got a civil case against Bluescape as well. So we have a full pipeline. In addition to those cases, we've got a very full pipeline of uh, cartel matters. Uh, we seem to be able to run two or three a year and we'll certainly keep doing at least that number going forward, so there'll be more cartel cases coming, whether they're criminal or civil, uh, will, will only become clear through time. A lot of important competition cases, the New South Wales ports proceeding, I think is really, really important because it links to privatisation issues, and sorry, I'm running over a lot of things quickly. Those who know what I'm talking about will know, but um, uh, the New South Wales ports issue is really fundamental and involved the privatisation of ports and agreements that we allege were anti-competitive. We've also got our Peter's ice cream case and of course our Tasmanian ports case which is the first section 46 case uh, that we have run. So that's also important. So a lot of very important competition cases going on that's uh, taking a lot of our resources to prepare for and get ready for. Uh, in December, we commenced a case against the CFMMEU and a large builder, Hutchison, in relation to alleged, alleged boycott conduct. Uh, and that also is a very important case, that the boycott conduct we're alleging there is conduct that 
in my view, does a lot of damage to the economy and needs to be dealt with. We've had a hell of a lot of uh, consumer and fair trading cases. We do mention these days consumer and fair trading because we want to make sure people understand that the consumer law applies to small business. So that's why we're now adopting language of consumer and fair trading. Uh, we've got very important franchising cases in relation to retail food group, mega save, motor vehicle cases in relation to consumer guarantee issues with Mazda, and of course our VW case where the $125 million penalty is being appealed. And we've got our three consumer cases in relation to Google and Facebook. And yes, Elizabeth, I'm terribly sorry they're consumer cases. I know the entire uh, legal fraternity here is wanting us to take a competition case, but I think those consumer cases are pretty fundamental to how the digital platforms operate and so we'll continue a, a competition and a consumer uh, focus. And then of course we've got our case against Telstra and Telstra's admitted that it acted unconscionably when sales staff at five licensed Telstra, Telstra branded stores signed up 108 Indigenous consumers to multiple postpaid mobile contracts which they didn't understand and could not afford and that is exactly the type of conduct we have to drive right out of Australia's economy. And that's why the unconscionable conduct provisions are so important and why we've got to make sure they work properly. We did have some interesting losses that I think illustrate some of the difficulties in, in court cases. Uh, we lost the Kimberly Clark matter. That was about um, what you can actually put down the toilet bowl. Sorry, you've finished eating, so that's fine. Uh, but, but what is flushable was the key question there. Uh, and we lost that case and the Jayco Caravans case where the judge found that the caravans actually weren't fit for purpose, but we lost the case anyway. The silver lining to those matters is that it allows us to point out to people just how difficult court cases are to win. Now, I know the lawyers here understand that and those who work in this area understand that, but you do actually have to get proof. You do have to win the case in court. Uh, and so when people are saying how completely idle and hopeless we are for not taking on this, that and the other, I do manage to wheel in these sort of cases and explain to them, well, this is what went on and we lost the case. So always looking for silver linings. Um, in relation to uh, merger work, uh, we haven't yet seen a significant increase in acquisition of firms in financial distress, so that's good news. Uh, I think, and I think generally people watching the economy, not only are we seeing the share price zoom up above 7,000, which is just extraordinary given the COVID year we've had, but I think the number of hardship matters hasn't been large and as I say, the number of mergers. So the economy has held up way better than we would have all, certainly I would have expected. But we do have a lot of merger matters. The, uh, we're, we're conducting a review of Woolworths move into uh, wholesale food distribution via its acquisition of PFD. Uh, we're looking at NAB's acquisition of Neobank 86400, uh, and there's a lot of other banking matters around. Uh, we do an awful lot on product safety. Um, it just consumes an enormous amount of our time. Uh, we had, for example, to quickly introduce a a standard in relation to hand sanitizers and being clear how much alcohol content there was because alcohol sanitizers were being sold without the right alcohol content. And as you can imagine, that's a bit of a problem. Uh, we had the Takata uh, airbag recall. Uh, we've got 99.9% .9 of the 3 million affected vehicles have been recalled and the airbags replaced. And that's just dealing with different models, different types of airbags made in different places according to different designs. It, it's been a, a very time consuming matter for us. Um, I'm going to just skip a bit. Oh, the last thing I just want to mention is NBN. Uh, obviously the pricing of NBN's wholesale services to its retailers is a huge issue and that's going to be an issue that's going to occupy a lot of our time in the coming year. and there's extremely strongly held views by stakeholders on both sides of that. 
Now, our 2021 compliance and enforcement priorities, uh, I may not list them all because I do want to stay roughly on time, although I'll run a fraction over. Uh, but the priorities are really important. We think they're really exciting. Um, the first one I'll mention is the pricing and selling of essential services. We just take too many cases in relation to telecommunications and energy. Uh, we shouldn't have to deal with all the matters we do. I mentioned the Telstra one earlier, but this will remain an important priority. Um, and one issue I will mention is we've now got the, the PEM big stick legislation, which despite all the fanfare, essentially its main provision is if you've had a significant reduction in costs, pass them on to consumers. Obviously, wholesale electricity costs have roughly halved, and we need to make sure that consumers get the benefit from that. Consumers have suffered as prices went up. It's only fair that they benefit as those prices come down. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of work in the funeral sector. It's a time when consumers are very vulnerable. Uh, there's a lot of market power issues in what is now a very concentrated sector, a lot of bundling of services, a lot of lack of transparency, and so we shall be focusing on that. We'll focus a lot also on the commercial construction sector. It still is a sector where you've got not only boycott activity, but the potential for cartel activity. Uh, and we have a number of cases on at the moment and we'll be announcing more this year. The finance sector will also be a priority, not just our home loan pricing inquiry and the recommendations in relation to that with the, the, the prompt. I mean, the trouble with home loans is it's very hard to know what the price is. Um, it, it's one of those markets where you just don't know what the proper price of the home loan is. So we wanna make sure people get a prompt to know what the prevailing typical rate that they should be getting so that they are more aware. We've also got important investigations underway in the finance sector, uh, and uh, Elizabeth, they are competition ones, you'll be pleased to know, and we should have some enforcement outcomes uh, over the next few months. We're also gonna be keeping an eye out for debt collection issues if we see that flowing from COVID. We'll also be doing more work on the travel sector um, because we just want to monitor forward sales practices by travel businesses about misrepresentations in advertising and marketing, uh, particularly as we get these uncertain uh, imposition of or lifting of travel restrictions. We want to make sure consumers are protected. The providers of these services should be allowing for that. They should be very clear and they shouldn't mislead consumers over their entitlements. We'll be doing a lot of work in the aviation sector. We've got a particular direction to monitor the aviation sector as it comes out of the COVID crisis. Uh, there's a, that's an issue coming up in the newspapers quite a lot. One issue I'll call out is monitoring the plans by Rex to enter the major domestic routes, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. And one issue we'll be watching very closely is to make sure they can get access to slots at Sydney Airport, which is the fundamental constraint. Uh, and whether Rex succeeds or fails, who knows, but they shouldn't not succeed because they can't get hold of the slots. A lot of work on small business, that's always a priority for us, uh, in particular the franchise sector. So we'll be doing a lot of work on that. Uh, the agricultural sector, continues to be a priority. Uh, I mean, we've got a group dedicated to digital platforms, construction, the finance sector, but also the agriculture sector, as well as gas and electricity. Uh, so these days we have got a lot more specialist expertise dealing with particular areas, and that's very helpful. Uh, we'll be looking at how the dairy code gets implemented. And of course, we've just done our perishable goods inquiry where we raise the issue of unfair practices and we'll be obviously pushing that. Consumer guarantee issues in motor vehicles and caravans in particular will be important. Um, I mentioned that JCO uh, outcome. Uh, I think it shows that consumer guarantees need to be illegal so that if 
companies aren't providing the consumer guarantee remedies, uh, that is against the law and we can take action. Just, uh, again, I'm watching the time a bit. Um, obviously, I've got a full speech going up on the website if it's not there now. Uh, just two other things to mention which we'll be focusing on a lot is button batteries, um, just appalling stories, uh, horrific deaths to children from these things. Um, we are proud that we've brought in a world first regulation. It is, it is truly a world first regulation in terms of uh, uh, making sure that consumer products have battery compartments that are inaccessible to children. Um, and hopefully that deals with the problem. We'll be doing a lot of compliance and education work in relation to that, and also a lot of work on quad bikes. In 2020, 23 people died on these things. They are inherently unstable. Uh, they roll over, and so we have proposals to address that. Uh, and our final uh, priority I'll mention is uh, our digital platforms work. Uh, We've got, obviously, uh, some actions uh, in the court, as I mentioned, consumer actions. Um, we've got a number of investigations underway. Uh, obviously, we've got our work on the ad tech inquiry, which came out about a month ago, and our report on apps, which will come out in April. And they are very much market power issues. They are very complicated issues. Uh, so they will occupy a lot of our time because, in part, we're looking at whether there's any uh, competition enforcement issues to take up or, indeed, whether there's any recommendations to be put to government. And in looking at those questions, we're in very close contact with our counterparts overseas. Uh, we've always been very close to our counterparts overseas, but I think it's fair to say that's ratcheted up quite a bit with all their work on digital platforms. So there'll be enforcement issues, as well as the ad tech and apps issues. Um, hopefully the bargaining code will get wrapped up this week, so that'll be done and dusted, but uh, we will see. Final topic on market studies and advocacy. Um, the government's recently directed us to do many inquiries. Um, we've recently included, concluded major inquiries into the cost of insurance in Northern Australia home loan interest rates, perishable, agri perishable agricultural goods, and a very big one will be presenting, it'll be released I think in March, our huge inquiry into the water, the Murray-Darling Basin water market. Now this is a unique market to Australia, it's fundamentally important to Australia, and this is our biggest report yet if you count the number of pages, so um, it's uh, a big one. Uh, what's called a door stopper. And of course, we've got our work on electricity and gas. Um, in terms of advocacy, we are going to continue to advocate uh, for the fact that, in our view, the Part 3A regime that deals with infrastructure monopolies doesn't deal with uh, standalone monopolies. It was designed to deal with vertically integrated monopolies. So we continue to have issues with the regulation of standalone monopoly assets. We think that's an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, also, a range of consumer issues. I've already mentioned making consumer guarantees illegal. We're very close, I hope, to making unfair contract terms illegal. Uh, so a lot of work there. Uh, we're going to continue to advocate in relation to unfair, unfair trading practices. Uh, we think there is a need for that. Uh, I accept that will be controversial. I accept uh, people will disagree with those things, with, with that issue, uh, but we very much look forward to the debate and having an unfair practices provision was a recommendation of both our digital platform inquiry and our perishable goods inquiry. Um, and we're also advocating for uh, a national safety provision. So if you're selling unsafe goods, it's not just something you've got to go out and recall the goods. You've actually got to have a hurdle that you uh, uh, went through to decide whether the good was safe to sell in the first place. And finally, on mergers. So 
Obviously, merger, and this is our final advocacy thing I'll mention, merger control just plays a critical role in ensuring that uh, competition is not eroded via mergers. In recent years, as people know, we've been increasingly concerned as to whether our merger control regime remains fit for purpose and achieves the right balance that you need in a merger regime to allow certain mergers to go ahead and others not to go ahead. In our view, increasingly, the uncertainty inherent, inherent in the forward-looking merger test is, has become a reason for clearing mergers. Merger parties and the courts are focused on what is likely to happen in the future without the acquisition, which is challenging to, approve in court, to, to prove in court. While this is a relevant issue to be considered, it's also open to manipulation and the focus on the counterfactual in many cases risks overlooking the likely anti-competitive effects of the merger itself. This is compounded by many of the merger factors lifted, listed in section 53, which can be used to support a merger being cleared. In our view, there's insufficient weight placed on the risks to competition in merger assessment, such as potential competition being lost, barriers to entry being raised, and competitors being foreclosed. The net result, in our view, is that our merger control regime is skewed towards clearance, which, prevents, which presents real challenges for the ACCC in seeking to prevent anti-competitive mergers. The goal of any merger regime must be to prevent anti-competitive mergers in order to preserve competition, which is so fundamental to the economy. So we think uh, the approach to merger control needs to be rebalanced. Uh, we're therefore going to be exploring law reform options in 2021, which we'll put forward at some stage during the year, but we recognise it's a complex area. So to conclude, the ACCC's work isn't limited to what I've spoken about. Um, I haven't, for example, talked about our transport work, our very important work on net back gas prices, which is going to be a very big deal this year. And I'm sure to the disappointment of you all, I haven't talked about our media bargaining code work, but it is before Parliament. Uh, so we both need to grow the pie and share the pie, and I'm hoping that our work going forward contributes to both of those objectives. Thanks very much for your time today. Now, Elizabeth has to work the technology. I just have to answer the question, so this is easy. As so long as the passcode doesn't lock me out, it should be okay. Um, thank you again, Rod. That was um, terrific. Um, and I'm sure everybody's dying to ask you questions about some of the things you mentioned. All right. Um, so the top voted question is... Are you concerned that the authorised cooperative conduct will have fostered relationships and changed mindsets in a way that may persist in an anti-competitive way after the authorisation ceases? No, we thought about that, uh, and that partly affected how the authorisations were framed, uh, and uh, also we had people uh, to varying degrees embedded inside the discussions that went on. So. No, we're very comfortable with that. And again, I must say, as one who spends a fair bit of time criticising companies, and people in this audience know that I do, I think Australian companies did extremely well in the way they approached all of that. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. Uh, and this is one that you won't want to answer, but I, I'm gonna, it, it's got a lot of votes. <laughs> if Facebook continues to block news content being accessed in Australia and Australian publications from being shared internationally, would you consider the news media bargaining code a success? Uh, you, you've predicted my answer completely. I mean, it's before <laughs> Parliament at the moment. Yeah. Uh, it is a day-by-day -day moving feast. Uh, so even if I did answer the question, which I won't, I'd be wrong tomorrow anyway. So uh, let's just see how it goes. Fair enough. 
uh, onto TPG and Vodafone. What lessons did you take out of the TPG case where Justice Middleton noted it was the companies that bore the risks of investing to compete in the market, not the ACCC? Can the ACCC deal with the risks? Oh, look, our job is quite clear. Our job is to uh, assess and where we form a view, appropriate view, oppose mergers that we think lessen competition. Uh, um, I, I accept companies take risks all the time, but that's got nothing to do with the job we have to do, uh, which is make sure that we have a competitive economy. And in fact, we've got a very concentrated economy. I think anybody looking back uh, would certainly not think that uh, we haven't had enough M&A in the past and that our economy is not benefiting from enough economies of scale. So uh, we, we just stick to our job, which is to try and make sure uh, as best we can and uh, we haven't always succeeded to make sure that there's mergers, not mergers going ahead which have an anti-competitive uh, effect. Fair enough. Um, I might ask a question now. We, we note with interest the US antitrust bill that Senator a Amy Klobuchar has proposed um, seems to uh, um, raise some of the concerns that you've expressed um, as well. I'd be interested to hear your view on the bill. I think that's the bill that said you've got to double the resources going to the regulators. So I just thought it was one of the great um, public policy initiatives uh, that I've ever heard. Uh, and I'll, look, there were a range of other things she's yep. got there. Yep. Um, uh, and I'm stretching my memory a bit, but to some extent, I think she wanted to uh, lower the hurdle bar considerably for the regulators to oppose mergers, if I remember correctly. Uh, in certain circumstances. I yeah, think, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just think, it, look, it's a really complex area and I think the digital platforms have shown up the complexity. Um, we uh, have seen how uh, Google and Facebook, for example, have uh, grown and increased their market power through a massive range of acquisitions. Um, at the time, I think most people would accept the regulators with current laws could not have prevented that. But I think that raises the question, uh, should we do something with our laws? And look, mm -hmm. it's, it is a very complex issue, but I think the digital platforms continue, I mean, they, they just do an enormous number of acquisitions. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, some of that's going to be grabbing expertise and some of it's going to be um, trying to make sure someone doesn't grow up to be a competitor. And how you work that out at those early stages is tricky. So yeah. I, I have sympathy with what she's trying to achieve. Exactly how you do it, I think, requires a lot of thought. But we will, the ACCC will put forward proposals on that issue in particular, as well as the general merger issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and we certainly will be looking at what's being proposed overseas. But the dominant recommendation was double the size of the... The, the, the budget Australia. would be helpful. That's right. yeah. Don't lose sight of that one. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Um, three years after the Harper amendments, how do you think the reforms are going? Uh, look, I think well. Um, I mean, there are a whole lot of things that came out yeah. of that. Obviously, the one that immediately uh, took effect was... Uh, or captured the attention was Section 46. I'm quite pleased with how that's gone. Yes, we've only got one case in court after how many every years it's been in, a couple of years now. Mm. Um, uh, but we've got some private litigation out there. I think it, has, it does have an effect on uh, how you all advise your corporate clients and therefore it has an effect on what companies do. So I'm quite, quite pleased with that change. Uh, we're trying to bring in the class exemptions, but that's proving a little difficult. There's a whole range of things uh, there, but uh, uh, at a general level, very, very pleased. Fair enough. Um, product labelling. How will the ACCC change its approach to product labelling matters given the results in Woolworths and Kimberley Clark? Uh, yeah, look. The Kimberley Clark one is tricky because yeah. that gets into that issue of uh, 
what it is you have to prove. It also gets into the issue that we've run into with what's a future matter and what isn't. And, of course, that runs into mm. whether you... I mean, generally with consumer law, when we allege something's misleading, what we have to show is that they didn't have a reasonable basis for saying what they said, but on other occasions we have to actually show what they said was wrong. And if they're making a scientific claim, we have to show scientifically that what they said is wrong. So, look, these are, these are tricky issues. Mm. Um, I, I don't really know exactly how we're going to change our approach to those issues, but uh, uh, we are giving that a lot of thought uh, because they, you know, we have had a couple of losses in areas where we were quite confident we would succeed. So there's certainly a couple of issues there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rod. Um, distressed asset transactions. Um, you haven't had to consider many uh, so far, as you mentioned, um, but how, um, how will you look at um, situations where the alternative outcome is likely to be bankruptcy, insolvency or otherwise? Yeah, look, we try and say... I've said throughout that we're not letting COVID affect our view on those things. Uh, it very much depends on the circumstances, you know, what's going to happen to the assets. I know that might seem a hard approach for those who are facing bankruptcy and the shareholders like wanting to get some return on the distressed assets, but we have to look and see what's the best competitive outcome. So we need to work out what's going to happen to the assets. I guess the area that we've had most trouble with under a distressed asset, asset sale heading is just the number of times when people get into trouble, they want to exit, and they go and sell the business to their main competitor. Uh, they could have sold it to others, and we've certainly had merger cases where they clearly could have sold the assets to others. I won't go into details. And they sell it to their nearest competitor. Now, why do they do that? They do that because their nearest competitor will give them the most money for it because of the anti-competitive benefits their big competitor gets from buying them. Uh, but they are cases we will look at very carefully and... I guess I would say if companies are in distress and they want a quick sale, don't sell it to your major competitor because that may well see us looking very closely at the acquisition and slowing down your ability to exit. So just have that in mind when you're thinking about doing that. Rod, just thinking about the way we work um, and have been working um, through 2020, are, are there changes um, that you've made or seen during the pandemic that you'd like to see um, through the recovery to continue? Yeah, look, it's a tricky one. I mean, we at the moment have a policy of uh, probably not the main thing you meant, but uh, from uh, people in the office half the time and working from home half the time. Uh, I think that's convenient for our staff. And if you want to hold, get the best staff, you've got to be aware of what works best for them. We also found that it helped productivity. Indeed, the biggest problem we had was telling people to stop working because they lost the discipline of being in and out of the office. Not that our people weren't working when they got home at the end of the day anyway, but they, they lost that so much that we had people working longer hours uh, and that caused problems. So mm -hmm. that's just one issue. Um, in terms of trying to move a bit faster, you mentioned the authorisations. We'll try and see how we can uh, deal with that. Um, and obviously the COVID task force work where we were sort of proactively intervening to solve the problem rather than take someone to court. So there's a lot of ways in which we moved a lot faster and I think we're more effective and so we're going to try and keep a bit of that. Easier said than done when you don't have a pandemic, but yeah. uh, I'm certainly looking forward to when we don't have a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, I think everyone would agree. <laughs> um, uh, so the High Court refused special leave in p and Horizon. What do you think they got wrong? Oh, look, uh, that's just a very complicated case. I think you really need to uh, almost go through the history of that case. And I know there's people here who think we mishandled the case. Uh, the legal advice we had I mean, was very complex legal advice to get your mind around. I spent an enormous amount of time on that, as did uh, many others. Uh, I mean, it is an interesting case because at the end of the day, we used to have two rail companies uh, taking containers up and down 
the east coast, now we've got one. We've got another one that runs a particular vertically integrated service, but you know, for Australia to go from two to one rail freight companies is a very bad outcome. Uh, worked out well for the seller because they got a higher price selling to their nearest, their only competitor. But in my view, there was no doubt there are other players who would have entered the market, absolutely no doubt, had they wanted to do that, but they wouldn't have got the proceeds they got. So I think it is a lovely example of how, uh, I mean, that is an acquisition that should not have happened. That, that should have been a different outcome. Uh, and that's a great, I mean, the Australian economy has lost enormously out of that transaction. There's no doubt in my mind. Mm -hmm. It's a classic for why we need to think about our merger laws. So thank you for the question. <laughs> you mentioned that you have a number of upcoming cartel cases, some criminal and some civil. How do you decide whether you're going to proceed criminally or um, civil prosecution? That must be a tough decision. Oh, look, they are tough decisions. And uh, obviously, there's just a whole lot of things that happen when you're doing something criminally versus uh, the much easier route to take them civilly. Look, it really depends on how egregious we think the contact was and the size of its economic impact. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's partly a judgment call of whether you think that criminal or civil will send the right messages that you want to send in terms of what companies cannot, can and can't do. So, uh, you know, if Marcus Betsy was here, he would entertain you for about an hour explaining how we do actually make that decision. But it, it's a bit of a judgment call, but yeah. got a lot to do with just what's going to send the right signal to the community, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, so in um, the digital platforms inquiry, um, you considered and made some findings in relation to market power in the context of digital platforms. How has that thinking evolved uh, since that time and um, how in particular in relation to the recent inquiries, have you had further thoughts about the the extent of that market power and, um, yeah. Uh, so the digital platform inquiry, it had a very broad terms of reference. Um, people were saying, what's a competition regulator doing getting involved in X, Y and Z? My answer is we're a competition consumer and we're a competition enforcer, a consumer enforcer, and we also deal with market power issues in infrastructure but also the terms of reference did talk about consumer impact and you couldn't avoid privacy issues. It talked about media, it talked about advertising. So we had to address that. Um, and that, I think all that's, I mean, that was why it was such a broad inquiry with such broad recommendations. I think it's fair to say virtually all of our recommendations are being taken forward in one way or another. I think we think the hit rate in terms of government following up our recommendations is pretty good, whether you think about the current review of privacy, a um, uh, whole range of things in terms of um, trying to align what happens online and offline, etc. But now that we've got the unit set up for five years, uh, we are digging deeper, and so the ad tech inquiry just deepens our knowledge of uh, the competitive issues with advertising technology, when you go to a website and it takes three or four nanoseconds for the ad to show up on your website, that's ad tech whirring around stunningly efficiently in the background. So trying to understand that and how it works. Uh, the apps market where you've got two main players, uh, I just think those are two big issues that will keep, will drive our attention this year. That's you know, apart from the bargaining code, which I hope will get sorted out, but uh, and there'll be a bit of follow-up uh, work, obviously, uh, but apps and ad tech will dominate us. Uh, and then you've got the whole issue that is relevant to the three enforcement cases we've taken is about data, data and the market power that comes from data, the misleading of consumers that can come from data. And look, there's tremendous benefits from the amount of data that people have, it, it, help, it does generate enormous economic efficiencies. We've just got to make sure we get ahead of the game and as best we can to make sure that it, it works for community benefit and we don't have the disadvantages of 
taking advantage of all this data in ways that, the, that, that is inappropriate and I'm sure the community wouldn't want. So those are the issues that are going to dominate us and that's really a, a... I guess what we're doing with digital platforms now is we're, we're narrowing our focus onto competition and consumer issues pretty well purely. So, uh, and that means much deeper dives into data, ad tech and apps. And that's going to take a lot of our time this year. It's going to be a major focus. I know I mentioned it last as one of our priorities, um, just to give the others air time, but that will take a lot of our time this year. Uh, I um, can already sense the busyness among the lawyers in the room, uh, as well as uh, among you and your we colleagues. We like to keep you fully employed. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Yeah, um, much appreciated. Um, Rod, we uh, could sit here all afternoon continuing to ask questions. There's no shortage of them here. Thank you for everyone in the room and uh, virtually who've contributed. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, Rod, we thank you once again for generously and so candidly um, sharing your views and um, the ACCC's priorities for the year ahead. It, it's always a bit of a, um, a lucky dip box for us and quite exciting one. Um, we're very grateful and I can't believe that it's been 10 years that you've been doing this. Um, looking forward to next year already. Um, meanwhile, I'm sure there'll be, um, there's much food for thought and um, fruit for the year to come. So thank you. Thanks, Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. On behalf of CEDA, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to Rod for the past decade. He's demonstrated his support of CEDA through this annual event, but also demonstrated his commitment to bringing these important policy discussions to a broader audience via the CEDA stage. Rod, we thank you for sharing the ACCC priorities and for your open responses to audience questions. Thank you also to Elizabeth and, the Gilbert, and to Gilbert and Tobin for your support of today's event, noting that you're also celebrating a decade facilitating CEDA's annual update from the ACCC. As a membership-based think tank, we're strengthened by our members' input and expertise. Finally, thank you to all guests that joined today's event in person and via the live stream. We appreciate your engagement online and encourage you to continue the conversation. I look forward to our next opportunities to connect, noting we have two additional live streams this week. Human Services, Health and Technology, taking place on Thursday, and the Lord Mayor's Panel, The Future of Australian Cities, taking place on Friday. You can still register online or find out more about our upcoming events at cedar.com.au. Thank you again all and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.